All right, team. Mm. Okay, I get the privilege of chatting with us all today. Set my thing. All right. So, um, a wee while ago, I got... Great worship, Dad, by the way. That was good fun. That was great worship. Um, a while ago, I was able to talk about Noah's Ark. Um, I don't know if it was the last time I spoke. might have been the time before that. But I brought a different kind of message around the story of Noah's Ark. And what I'd like to do today is build off of the last, yeah, uh, chat that we had about that. Now, what I spoke about, I'm not sure if you'd be able to remember or not, but can we just turn this down a wee bit? It's just reverberating a bit. Um, however grand the story of Noah's Ark is, and uh, the story that we might have been told as as kids, and we have quite a nice heartwarming like reflection towards and everything. It's a it's a really great story, and we all love it. And everything in the Bible has quite a significant and serious subtext and undertone to it, and what that would mean for every story. So, with that, um, I spoke about kind of the the shape, the unmovableness of the ark, and how that symbolized um, God's kind of like protection over us, what we're housed in when troubles come, and the reconciliation that the overall story looks when it comes to Noah's ark in the restoration of man to God as well. That's a very brief overview, but I want to build off of that. And so we're going to look this morning at different things that happened on Noah's Ark, um, as told in Genesis, and look at potentially how that could reflect back to us um, in how we walk in our, in, in, in our journey with Jesus, and how we then can apply that so that we can go out and have confidence and assurance of, of our relationship with God plus then what we're supposed to be doing. I, I don't believe that ever someone should be able to come to the building and be with the church on a Sunday and not hear some form of repackaging of the gospel and an encouragement and challenge to then go and live a more godly life. And so um, trying to put all of that together in this. All right. Okay, right. let's pray. Jesus, I just want to thank you for uh, Sunday and having um, a day that's set to um, be able to come and join with uh, so many other people in our family and um, learn more about you and worship and praise and, and give you back the glory and uh, everything that you deserve. And Lord, I pray, Father, that you would just be uh, helping give a, a better revelation, a deeper revelation of who you are, Lord, that you would um, be speaking through me this morning, Lord, and changing ideas and changing heart spaces and working uh, so powerfully in, in the minds and the lives of everyone here, including me. Lord, I pray that you would be um, just working as we learn more about you from uh, the book that you've given us. In Jesus' name, Lord, we love you. Amen. 
Okie dokie. So, <clears throat> the story of Noah's Ark is in Genesis 6 to 9. Uh, it is a great story. One of my favorites is, is my favorite story. You talk to guys generally about what's their favorite like, story in the Bible. They're like, David and Goliath or Samson. And I'm like, Noah's Ark, actually. And it gets you be quite morbid. I like it when everyone dies. <laughs> but um, no, nah, it's not just that. Uh, I, <laughs> I could laugh. I don't just love the book, uh, the, the the story of Noah's Ark. I I just I just feel quite deeply connected to it um, because I I see it from a different perspective. I see it from a different lens. It's like when people see different things. Fun fact of the day is that every single person here is never ever going to see reality for actually what it really is. Every single person is never going to see exactly the right thing and the exact thing of, um, of reality, of how, how it actually is. And the reason why we don't see anything the exact way that it is is because everybody is viewing life in their experiences um, and what they have in front of them through their own eyes and mind. And so everything is through your perception. So we take my iPad up here. I see an iPad and you see an iPad and both of us are equally right, but both of us are meaning something completely different. I can see something completely different to what you can see. However, they're both correct, just our, pers our perceptions are different. And so in much the same thing, people can look at the exact same story of... Noah, it is Noah, yeah. For a second I thought it was Moses. Yeah. People can look at the story of Noah and you can see one thing and I can see another and it doesn't mean that anyone's wrong. It's just a different view, a different perception of the thing that it is. So we're going to read through a little bit of the story um, going from in Genesis 8. If you've got your Bibles, you can read along with me in your book. Uh, however, we'll go through. The, uh, the verses should come up as well. But we're going to read a bit, and then we're going to talk a bit, and then we'll read a bit more, then we'll talk a bit more, and then we're done. Nice and quick. Should be done in about three hours. So, we got Genesis 8, verse 1. But God. Okay, really quickly. Whenever, uh, I've already lost one, Okay. Not doing too well. Uh, when, when you see the word but, what does but mean? The word but, when you see it in the Bible, uh, originates from the terminology of the word that everything beforehand doesn't really matter. So now, start listening. That's my interpretation of it. And so it starts with, okay, cool. Told you a bit of a story and everything, but God. Okay, so now. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Oh, yes, it's fair enough. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth, at the end of the 150 days, the water had gone down. And on the 17th day of the seventh month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month, and on the first day of the 10th month, the tops of the mountains became visible. After 40 days, Noah opened a window that he had made in the ark and sent out a raven. And it kept flying back and forth until the water had dried up from the earth. Then he sent out a dove to see if the water had receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could not find anywhere to perch because there was water over all the surface of the earth. So it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and took the dove and brought it back to himself in the ark. 
Verse 10, he waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. When the dove returned to him in the evening, there in its beak was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then no one knew that the water had receded from the earth. He waited seven more days and sent the dove out again. But this time it did not return to him. By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering from the ark, saw that the surface of the ground was dry. By the 27th day of the second month, the earth was completely dry. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring out every kind of living creature that is with you the birds, the animals, and all the creatures that move along the ground so they can multiply on the earth and be fruitful and increase in number on it. So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his son's wives. All the animals and all the creatures that move along the ground and all the birds, everything that moves on land came out of the ark, one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord and taking some of all, all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease." Great story. Great ending. Well, that's not the end. Plot twist. If you haven't read it yet, that's not the end. But there's a couple of moments in here that I want to focus on primarily. The first one that I'd like to look at is something that we could spend the entire of today on, but we won't, but we're going to pick it apart a little bit. And that is the sending out of the raven and the dove. Okay? Now, people understand the difference between a raven and a dove, that they're both very two different, two different birds, both very different, uh, I was going to say races, but it's like colors. Um, one is black and the other is white. And one is a bird that scavenges off of anything. If whether it's good food or bad food, it will try and eat whatever it can to get sustenance. Ravens are known as an unclean meat. And even though in the Bible there are continuous references to ravens doing good things, just because they're good things doesn't mean that it can't be replicated somewhere else and meaning something different. You can find ravens just like vultures feeding on carcasses and feeding on things that would be rotting and detrimental to themselves. Um, But they eat it because they go with their instincts and just eat what's in front of them. Doves, on the other hand, they are drawn to and aim to only consume dry and clean food. So, (laughs) Ashley's saying, like me, because she's a vegan. Kind of. (laughs) But, yeah, the the difference in in the two of these, both of them still get to eat. Both of them still have the, uh, what's built into them is still the I guess, infrastructure and like coding of a bird in how to fly, in how to do life, in how to lay eggs, in how to make nests and do everything. But both of them are very different in how they feel themselves and in how they act. So we see that Noah sends out a raven first and we don't ever hear of the raven coming back to the ark, whether it did or not. And the reason why is because the raven goes back and forward trying to find dry land. 
you can kind of draw to conclusion that at some point he got tired or she got tired. I'm not saying it's a boy. Could be a girl. Could be a girl dragon. I mean dragon. Could be a girl raven. <laughs> Could be a dragon. Um, at some point, maybe he got tired. At some point, it may have uh, gotten that tired that it and that it couldn't find ground because it was trying to do everything by itself. Also, couldn't find its way back to the ark. And you can kind of assume you don't get food for enough time. You probably died. That is all speculation. I'm making that up. We don't hear about it, but you can. We we've got minds for a reason, and we can think about these things. So you can imagine that type of scenario may have happened, seeing as God, Noah, then did what uh, he felt led to do um, in sending out a dove afterwards. So a dove got sent out, and because it couldn't find anywhere to rest, it just turned around and came home, came back to safety and security, came back to peace and it came back to where it knew uh the the yeah the clean food and and like dwelling where where it had been um because it couldn't it couldn't go anywhere else until the moment where the next time it found something but it still couldn't stay out there even though it found something good it couldn't stay out there grabbed a piece of the olive leaf which we now symbolize with, with peace, with um, making amends, with all that sort of stuff, and then brought that back to Noah as well. And then when Noah sent it out again, it did not return because it had no reason to return. Everything that was ready for it out there in the world was there. <sighs> Later on in the Bible, we see other references to, to a dove pictured as the Holy Spirit in, in when Jesus gets baptized by John the Baptist. And it said the Holy Spirit came upon, came upon Jesus as a dove. That's cool. What if the dove never stopped flying around? Just rested then. But no, different one. Maybe, maybe not. Yeah. However, Noah did what he thought he should do in making sure that everything was ready and prepared for his safe departure from the ark. And in that, he trusted a dove that could only eat clean and dry food. And so then when it didn't come back... He, not, he knows that out there it's, it's dry and it's clean and, and it's now habitable. We can, we, we can go out. Us as ravens are people potentially without God, doing our own thing, going from a place of, um, going from a place of when, we're, when we're let out, we're let free, whether that's birth, whether that's at some point in your life, you go out and try and do everything you can on your own to try and make your life work as best as you can on your own without God and you, you're left getting tired and hungry and in need of rest and you, don't, and you never receive it because you're trying to do everything on your own. And then... Maybe at some point the ground does dry up and you've lasted all that long. You're naturally drawn to the thing that's going to kill you. You're naturally drawn to, the f to consume what isn't good for you. You then move through... Yeah, no, we'll say there. Ravens are symbolic of 
not just like people or flesh, but they are also kind of in this story, I read them as being symbolic of a person without God. Um, we have the opportunity and the blessing of being with Jesus and having the Holy Spirit. And, and our lives look very different. So we can understand the, the idea of, oh yeah, with sin, that's what my life would look like. And without sin, it would look very different. But we're not given the story of two birds that can operate in both lives, one as a dove and one also as a raven. So we can't really see the difference, um, like coexisting with each other. But we can understand a person that might be fueled, thinking nowadays, a person that might have the spirit of a raven or the spirit of a dove. If the dove looks or is symbolic of the Holy Spirit and we can be filled with the Holy Spirit, then we're going to be filled with someone that is, that is led to dry and clean things, that is led to safety and security, that is led to uh, peace and wanting re restoration. If the dove is symbolic of a spirit, then the raven can be symbolic of a spirit in that spirit of the enemy, that of the flesh, that wants to be driven to those unclean things and, to, and doing it itself. Does that make sense? Cool. So, that is... That's the, first, that's the first thing. Ravens, doves. Got that? We can lock that away? Yeah. Sweet. So, when... When the dove goes out, it doesn't come back, and no one knows. Okay, sweet. Like, it's all good now. He has spent a lot of time on the boat, on the ark. He spent a lot of time. He's 600 and something. 50, I think. No, 601st or something. I can't remember what I just read. 600 and... 601st year. Okay. Verse 13. First month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up. Noah then removed the covering of the ark and saw the surface of the ground was dry. And so he's 601... Someone would say that's elderly. You then are like, cool, what am I going to do here? I've also just endured a hundred and something, 150 days of constant rainfall. Not this rainfall that we've been having. The other day when we had hail, it was loud. I was up at 1 a.m. in the morning, couldn't sleep because there's a tin roof on the shed and that's all I can hear is just rain. Uh, sorry, it was hail. And... And at that point, I was like thinking, oh man, I can't sleep. This is going to be hard. That was for like an hour. This was a hundred and something years because we don't actually know when the actual heavens ceased to when the water dried up, all that sort of thing. We don't know if it was constant. We can imagine that rain enough to cover the earth may have been heavy. So you've also gone through all of that as well. As a person, you can understand that this is... <sighs> This is a very different experience. Never being able to go outside unless you get pelted down with rain, all that sort of stuff. So, situation has changed dramatically from living inside of an ark to do I want to go outside? I've just seen 150 days ago, I saw waters come through and kill everybody. How do I know that this is going to be all good and safe to be able to go out of the ark as well? So, God says, Go. And Noah just says, okay, when kids are about five to seven years old, you ask a child, can you play the guitar? And they're like, yeah, I can play guitar. They go and play and they're not good. They might be good. They may be a prodigy. But they're really, they're just not great. They are just like, yeah, I can play it. Can you do this? Yeah, of course. I can go do this. And then you're like, oh, okay, cool. So can you cook this? Yeah, we can. We can do that. Because they don't have any fear. They, 
uh, being directed, and they're like, yes, yeah, we'll, just, we'll just do this, not even absentmindedly. They're just like, I have confidence and assurance in myself. I know I can go and do this because someone's like, say, hey, can you do this? And you're like, yep, sweet. And then from about the age of 7 to 11 is when someone, uh, a child, develops the mind to be able to think for themselves, and they get this, psychologically, they develop the neuroprocesses to be able to understand embarrassment and shame. And so then if they, they get asked to do something and they know that they're bad at it or they can't do it as well as somebody else and that comparison comes in, then they're more, more hesitant to do the action that you've asked them to do simply because of the fact that they may fail and that fear of failure paralyzes them from doing it. So they say, no, I can't do that. Difference between confidence and age there. Noah, being 651, no, 601, we're mixing up my numbers. Noah, being 601, God says, go out, and he's like, okay, straight away. Not disregarding everything that he'd been through in his life and seeing everyone die and everything, he just, he just in, the insur- in the assurance and confidence that he had in God, said, okay, I will do what you say. Without hesitation, just went out. He then had a whole tribe of people with him that came out of the ark as well, who may not have had the same faith as him, but still had faith in Noah as he followed God and said, okay, cool, we will come out and follow it as well. So then what happened was he went out, and we don't know the length of time that this happened with, but... Noah's first intention was to then to create an altar and to, 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 to sacrifice, um, make, make a sacrifice to God on that. After the tumultuous, circ- tumultuous, look at that word. After the tumultuous circumstances of what Noah had gone through, his first instinct was obedience, which is the root of all worship in regards, in regards to God. But then after the obedience came worship in the act of an altar building and sacrifice, giving something back, yeah, to, to God. The very first thing that we are called to do as people who are, have gone our own way, no matter what the experiences are in our life and how bad something in our perception can be that that are that are real feelings as well because everyone has everyone has different experiences that happen to them in their life and they can all have varying uh strength and weight on them your first instinct in repairing and reconciling your life with christ is obedience and then After obedience comes worship. So, Noah, seeing this big thing happen on the earth, understanding that he needs to give God everything, is like, cool, my first thing to do is to make my family right with God. Even though he'd done the obedient thing the whole time and did exactly what God had asked him to, his first instinct, even after God delivered them from the rains, from the flood, gets out, new world, I need to, I need to worship God. There's in Romans uh, chapter, chapter something, Romans chapter 12 verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in a view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. No other, no other subtext to this. One verse. No other subtext to one verse. There is stuff that comes afterwards. But in this letter to the Roman church, what Paul's saying here is... Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Therefore, I urge you, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice is always at the mercy of the person who has the altar. 
And so a sacrifice that is living knows that they are always at the mercy of the person who's going to, to do it, right? If... Mm, nope, don't go there. Okay, that was wrong. Cool. So, when someone becomes a Christian, when, when we turn from, from our ways to God's ways, the Bible tells us that, sure, okay, John 3.16, God loved the world so much that everyone who believed in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Um, and it says that it's by Ephesians 2, verse 9. No, it's not on my arm. For all have been saved by grace, not by works. So there's, there's nothing we can boast about it, right? All have been saved. It's already been done. The sacrifice that had to happen was Jesus on the cross. Paid the, paid the price for all of us. Belief in him is what saves you. In becoming a Christian, inviting Jesus into your life is a, is a sacrifice of yourself to allow space in you for Jesus to come in. The act of becoming a Christian in repenting of your sins and inviting Jesus into your life, because that's what he says that you need to do in order to become a Christian, the act of obeying that and deciding to choose to follow Jesus in itself is worship to him. So as you become a Christian and you get reconciled, no, why did I do that? And you get reconciled, not in quotation marks, to God in that act of reconciliation, the very first thing you do when you come out of comfort into something that you're like, okay, cool, now, now this is the, 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 the decision point. <laughs> I just started so bad. <laughs> As you, when you get to the decision point, the very first thing you do is obedience. Do exactly what God's asked you to do. Invite Jesus into your life. I'm choosing it? Cool, and I'm doing it. The moment that you invite Jesus into your life because you say, Jesus... I accept you into my life. I know I've done bad things. I want to now give up that part of my life and I want to serve you in whatever capacity that looks like and the surrender and sacrifice of your flesh to go God's way is then the worship that goes towards him. So your Christian life started in the exact process that God intended it for it to happen. And now, every single moment after that, when you, when everyone... Everyone sins every single week, every single day. Everyone does. And if you think you don't, you do. And the process of restoring or getting our lives right with Jesus every single day is what he asks us to do in, in asking for repentance and asking us to change our hearts and minds to reflect more of him and spending more time with him. That process is continued on for the entire of our lives. We're never going to be perfect. I know some people think that they are perfect and R Greg thinks he's perfect. He just smiled. At me. <laughs> and, and the reality is, is that we're not. Jesus is perfect and our entire lives are on a trajectory to becoming like him in the timing that God intends for us as well in our own personal relationship with him. So Noah leaves the ark and goes and does all, this, all, these, all these things. Builds an altar, sacrifices, holy, pleasing aroma. God then says, smells it. Hmm. You know what? I love this and I, 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 I'm not going to do this again. And he makes that promise. He makes that covenant. The because of, even though God knew and had intended a certain thing to happen, and it did happen, God was like, cool, I am forever going to be with Moses and this, and Moses, with Noah and with my people. This is, this is what I wanted from the beginning. 
and he gives us a couple of things. Gives us the, the, that, that, that covenant, which was in the symbol of a rainbow. Now, a rainbow isn't actually a rainbow in the sky like we can see it. Like we see it just going from horizon to horizon. But if you see it from space, it's just a circle, which is an infinite loop. And it never has an end, it never has a beginning. Um, which you can say about any shape, sure. This is a circle, lots of circles. When you see it from a different perspective, it's a very beautiful thing, it's very colorful. And the original purpose of a rainbow was to remind us of the promise that God, God made ages ago, that he, wasn't, he was never going to flood the earth like that again, destroy everybody. Now, the enemy likes to come in and he likes to change up the way in which we and distract us from the way in which we see his prom uh, God's promises to us. So now, a rainbow in our current day and age means something very different. And I'm not here saying that's right or wrong, but I am reminding us of the real reason why the rainbow exists. And the real reason the rainbow exists is because God, at one point, saved people from complete destruction and gave them a way to live and be restored to him. And he promised that he was never going to do that again, resulting also in the story, the symbolic replication of that in the Bible, to then God making a way for Noah to be, Noah to be saved from the world that he was in and restoring him back to relationship with him looks very much the same way as God providing Jesus to save us from the life that we had in that sacrificial process as well. Now, oh no, full stop. That's a thought, finished. Then there was something else that as we're finishing up that I wanted to kind of bring to our attention. This is also symbolic as well. However, you can have, it's completely up to your interpretation. Just right now, you have to listen to mine, interpretation of it. So <laughs> that's my influence. But God then says to Noah a bit later on in Genesis 9, 8 to 17. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant with you and your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals and those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I'm making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. Never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will see it. After he assures again and again, just a reminder process, look, I'm, I'm telling you so many times now, this is what I'm doing. Don't be swayed. Just know that I'm going to continuously remind you throughout the rest of your life that of this promise. I'm going to remind you continuously and constantly that I saved you and you're all good. Don't stress, just rely on me. He's got that. And, and God makes that point very clear. He says to Noah and his descendants, now go and populate, right? Go make and, and it says in the Bible that, and from there, all the people of the earth came to be. If we look at the story of Noah's Ark, and we look towards the future of the Bible, towards the New Testament, and we see, okay, cool, well, if Noah's Ark was a story about God restoring us to life with him, and then Jesus was God's ultimate plan in restoring us to relationship with him, and then God says, to Noah, now go, and, and all the people of the earth, that's how they came to be, was from that. 
then how is that symbolic of us if we are God's people? Well, then, if we look forward, then we see in Matthew 28 that God says, Now go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, um, and teaching them to obey the commands that I've given you, and surely I'm with you to the end of the age. And if in Noah's story, that's how all the people came to be, then in the Christian story, that's how all the world came to be. Because we were given the task of now going and telling people about it. As I say every single time I chat from the front, I say to us, there is a, everything that we take in, all the knowledge that we have, the reason isn't just for us. The reason that we have this knowledge is to go and share it with somebody else. And that looks very different with everybody, who they share it to and why. But the reality is, is that at a certain point in time, you will cease to be here. And at that moment, you, who have Jesus, get life with Christ, which is a glorious thing, which is a really exciting thing. There are people on earth that don't have that reality, and they deserve to have it. And that's the reason why we tell someone about who Jesus is. Is not, not because we are doing our duty in what God called us to do, but because our love for someone to have what we have should be fueling us to go and talk to them. You can share the story of Noah and the ark and see someone come to know Jesus. You don't have to sit down with a 10-page a booklet and say, well, these are all the verses. You can just tell them of a historic event that happened. And we know, sure, this is what it says in the Bible, and people have said before, maybe the Bible can be discounted and everything because it was written by so many people. How do we know that it's the inspired word of Jesus, of the Holy Spirit? How do we know that this is accurate and everything? When at some point, if you look deep enough into the histories of most civilizations within the world that we have records of, you will see that all of them point to the fact that at some point there was a big flood. And so you kind of look at that as, could this be real? Well, it's supported by so many people. And these aren't Christians. These are supported by just, yeah, cultures, people groups, countries. So we're like, cool, well, if this is real... And this story, if we understand it in its full perplexity, perplexity, complexity. Julia, this is great. You got it. Yeah, she is. <laughs> this is great. If you understand it in its full complexity, but also its simpleness, in that this, it, you, you can have a conversation with anybody and you can change their life. If you tell somebody about the fact that there's a boat that someone was on and it saved them from death and the only way that they knew about to make the boat was because someone told them and they ask, well, give, give me a bit more about that. Then you go into it. You don't need to share anything else. You share that. You take the initiative to share something about Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. You leave the results up to God. God can do the rest. He's done more with less. The story of Noah, ultimately, is a story about reconciliation of us to God. It's just a picture of that. Very much in the same context as how the ark was the saving, the saving of Noah. So the entire story in itself is a picture of the coming of Jesus and the restoration and the reconciliation that we would be experiencing in our relationship with God as well. That's the big thing about Noah, about Noah, about Noah's Ark. That's all it really boils down to. And we can take it with that. We can take it with the story of Joseph and the lots of colours coated coat story. We can take it with 
Moses, we can take it with anything. Every single story in the Bible points to the reconciliation of man with God. And so we can find peace in that and know that there are so many instances of that. This is what we're called to do. This is the relationship that we're called to have and we should go and talk about it with other people. I'm not, tell- I'm not telling you to. The Bible is. If you don't have that relationship, come and talk to us because we want to have that chat. If you... Dad's getting up. If you want to know more about that, come and have that chat because I want to talk about it. At the end of the day, when something goes really well in your life, when you win something, when when Crane goes and wins a fight, Ashley does not stop talking about it because it's the it's 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 the highlight of her year if something so great that it saves your life happens you should have no excuse but to want to talk about it that's what we want to do we love it the other day i had the opportunity to go pick somebody up from somewhere cuz they were trying to get to julia's house and they didn't get to julia's house i went and picked them, pick pick that person up it was Janet. Janet. Janet went to, the, to a different house and I got to the house and the people there had started having conversation with me. They were talking about the fact that never before had they actually had a conversation with each other about Jesus, but the son had just recently found faith this year and was going through his stuff and... He picked up his Bible and was dusting it off. And he went and talked to his mum and said, there are no Bible studies around here because the church that he was going to was in North Adelaide. As he has that conversation, Janet knocks on the door. And, and, then, and God knew what he was doing because Janet knocking on the door brings them out to, to meet with them, to meet with Janet, and they're like, cool, you need to get somewhere. Is there anyone we can call? They call Dad. Dad naturally calls me. Can you go do it? Dad was at home. I was out at Woolworths. I was driving on the way home, and I would have been going straight past them. So I was like, yeah, for sure. So I just nip in, pick up Janet, and we were talking for half an hour, probably, while this young 22-year-old guy was asking question after question after question after question, And there was, in that moment, as much as I hadn't eaten dinner yet, there was nowhere else I wanted to be but to be chatting with them. As the mum was talking and expressing her things of her life and her story and things that were coming up, there was nothing more that I wanted than to share who Jesus was with these people. And then the moment came, Janet jumped in the car and dropped her off at Julia's. But I could have gone to Janet, picked her up and left in, in one minute. But there was an opening to share and to explore why is this conversation happening? Why, why now? Let me just ask the question. Let myself be humbled enough to be asked questions and to not get on a defensive, but to hear someone's story and to be able to chat with them and say, Okay, cool. I'm going to take every opportunity as an initiative to share Christ. This is what we do. This is what we believe. Come check us out. Subsequently, then, the guy has also been messaging me every day since, which has been great. (laughs) He is a hairdresser in Beach Road. (laughs) Um, But yeah, it's, it's it's a choice. Just as much as it first was a choice, to share Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results up to Him is also a choice as well. So I'll leave that with you guys today. If you'd like some prayer, then please come up. We're going to sing another song to finish off. Um, And yeah, if if you would like any prayer or anything, come out to the front. We've got 
uh, people like Cherie, Karen, Alex, who will come and pray for you. Alrighty? That's it. That's me. Done. Let's pray. Thank you, <laughs> guys. Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for the stories that you have given us. Thank you for the people who have lived, who then record uh, what their experiences were so that we can learn from them. Father, thank you that you have uh, so intricately and um, so wise, fully, uh, just made a way for us to continuously be reminded of you in everything. Lord, thank you that you, uh, that you save us. Thank you that you provided the way. Thank you that uh, you want to have a relationship with us that continuously moves us further and further into a deeper relationship with you. Thank you that you're always drawing us closer in whatever way that looks like for us. Lord, help us to have the conversations with each other and with the people that don't know you about our relationships with you, about our lives. Help us to, as we grow closer with you, help us to grow closer with each other. Help us to share our testimonies. Help us to not be shy of what it is that you have given us. Help us to be challenged to be talking about you in a way that attracts people to you. Help us to not live our lives in a way that, that does not show you either. Father, thank you for the opportunity that you give us in asking for forgiveness. And pray, Lord, that as we continue to, to live out our lives for the next week until we meet again, and from that point onward, Lord, that you would just be uh, continuously molding and shaping our lives to look more like you every day. We love you. Amen.